Well, welcome everybody to today's virtual demonstration um, presented by Morgan Advanced Materials. Um, this is the third virtual demonstration event we've been doing since um, we've all been closed down um, due to the pandemic and we've had great success and we're happy to be able to reach uh, many more people and get some great video footage um, to capture what you might have seen in person at a facility. So uh, there are people on from both Massachusetts and beyond. So I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview about uh, the Tura program, Toxic Use Reduction Program, as well as TURI, Toxic Use Reduction Institute, um, and then introduce folks from Morgan Advanced Materials. So many of you may be aware the Massachusetts Toxic Use Reduction Act was adopted in 1989. Um, so we have now been around for a little while. Um, the goal was to have a 50% reduction in hazardous waste by product generation, uh, which was achieved. Um, and our primary mission is to help Massachusetts companies and communities reduce the use of toxic chemicals, while at the same time promoting competitive advantage um, of those businesses. So we wanna make sure that um, assistance we provide takes into consideration um, maintaining economic viability and making, it, making good economic sense when changes are made to processes to reduce the use of toxic chemicals. As part of the program, companies must publicly report the annual amount of toxic chemicals that they use um, when they hit certain thresholds and they have to conduct toxic use reduction planning every uh, two years and also pay an annual fee. So the corporate principles of toxic use reduction, we like to look at it as an inverted triangle where source reduction or toxic use reduction, um, hitting things at the source is the way to go because you're gonna get um, more bang for your buck, if you will, because if you're not using those toxic chemicals in the first place, then you don't have to deal with the training and the PPE and the waste disposal, et cetera, um, at, that you would when you're dealing with the toxic chemical. And for those of you who have taken the Toxic Use Reduction Planner course, you would be well familiar with the six TUR techniques that we focus on. Um, and our, our virtual demonstrations have allowed people to see these options in action. The three, there are three agencies that make up the Toxic Use Reduction Program, MassDEP, that deals more with the compliance and enforcement end of things under the program, OTA, Office of Technical Assistance, that provides on-site free confidential technical assistance, and then TURI, the Toxic Use Reduction Institute, who provides trainings, grants, uh, research, we um, conduct alternatives assessments, policy analysis, and also provide technical support, and we have a laboratory and a library as well. So the reason we're highlighting Morgan today is that they did a great TUR project and they also received a Turi industry grant two years back now um, to purchase new equipment, which is what uh, they're gonna tell you all about. And I just wanna iterate to those of you who, in Massachusetts who might be interested in applying for a grant in the future, um, that if you're a manufacturer in Massachusetts, you may be eligible for the industry grant. You can learn more online at turi.org and you can find the applications online there as well. It's very simple uh, process to go through to apply. And the, the new awards for fiscal year 21 have just been um, made and we will open the request for proposals back up in the spring of 2021 for the following fiscal year. Um, but just to give you some ideas of other grant projects, um, last year we had folks working on replacing NPB, replacing TCE, um, reducing sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid um, in their process, uh, reducing lead, reducing use of sulfuric acid, and testing alternatives to sodium hydroxide in a cleaning process at a suit manufacturer. So those are just some ideas of other projects. And this is our contact information. That's what our office would look like should we be there. Um, so with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Matt Markow. Matt is um, a process engineer at Morgan Advanced Materials. He's been there for a little bit over, uh, over four years and he graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with a degree in mechanical engineering. Take it away, Matt. Set there, Matt. Okay, so I was struggling to figure out how to unmute myself for a quick second. You are unmuted. Go ahead and put it in your slide share view and off you go. All right. There we go. So thank you very much, Joy. Uh, as Joy mentioned, uh, I'm with Morgan Advanced Materials for a little over four years now. 
and I'll be talking about our process to eliminate TCE from our facility. A quick background on uh, Morgan Advanced Materials, specifically in New Bedford. Uh, Morgan Advanced Materials is a global company. We're UK based, publicly traded on the UK stock market. And we have various different applications, business units that we're in. Specifically in New Bedford, we focus on the medical implant, medical imaging and aerospace uh, market segments. Primarily our products are used as electrical feed throughs, anode cathode assemblies or a junction housing. Uh, internally in house, we are capable of doing raw ceramic manufacture from making the raw ceramic powder, hydro dye pressing, doing ceramic green and hard machining, a thick film metallization and then a brazing process. Most of our products Last year, we're focused in the aerospace business with roughly 56% of our site sales coming in that area. And the remainder was pretty evenly split between the x-ray and implant business. So overall, uh, we're about 150 employees with $34 million in sales. And we're located just 45 minutes south of Boston in New Bedford. Highlighting some of our projects. On the far left, we have a medical implant feed through that we use. Uh, this consists of a ceramic a flange and pins that is our customer uses to take the electrical signals from outside the main device and transmit them to the internals of the device that helps to uh, assist in whatever implantable problem that we're in. Uh, some of our devices are used in cochlear hearing aids to assist with hearing as well as the pacemaker is one of our cathode assemblies for our medical imaging projects. This is used uh, to isolate some of the high electron and high energy lines to take the x-rays or CT scans or assist in the MIR equipment. On the far right, we have a product from our aerospace, oil and gas and industrial product line. This product is specifically focused into a laser application that uses a lot of high energy and the ceramic is used to help insulate that into the desired areas. Our manufacturing process consists of four main steps. We have our raw ceramic production, which as I mentioned, we are able to do in house. Uh, this consists of pressing ceramics, sintering them at high temperatures, grinding operations, height grinding, centerless grinding, form grinding to form desired features. And then we move them on to our next process, which is our metallizing and plating application, which is critical to allow the ceramic body to join to the metal assembly in the final operation. Metallizing and plating, we do a thick film metallization process, which is done by hand coating, or we have a few automated processes or a screen printing, similar to screen printing applications for t-shirts or we do a thick, thin film metallization, which is used in a sputter coating machine. So we also do some metal prep. Uh, so we'll receive and purchase our raw material metals from outside vendors, bring them in house and do any preparation to the metal that need be. Typically this includes a plating process to make the base material more easily jointable to the ceramic through the brazing process. The final process is our assembly manufacturing line. This is where we take all of our raw components and assemble them together. We have capabilities of vacuum brazing and continuous atmosphere brazing in hydrogen and nitrogen atmospheres. Most manufacturing incurs the use of hazardous chemicals, specifically process we're talking about now will be trichloroethylene. Trichloroethylene was used throughout our manufacturing process in various steps, and we've been able to eliminate it in different areas in different segments over the past four to five years. We use it in wax removal after ceramic grinding. Um, so we will grind our ceramics to a final height, lap them, make sure that they're flat and within our customer specification. And to do that, we adhere them to the grind plate using two different kinds of waxes and we need to remove that and fully remove it, get rid of any residuals in order to create a clean surface in order for us to braze to. We also use grease 
during a hermeticity check on our final assemblies. This is to verify that the joints that we've created in our brazing process are hermetic and leak tight. When you have our products going into the body or into up into high applications, we want to make sure that there's no fluid that will leak through over time. So we use a leak check machine to ensure that everything is encapsulated and we don't have any large areas where liquid or any other potential contaminant gas could get through our assemblies. Part of that, we use grease to help make seals on uh, rubber gaskets. And we used, we previously used trichloroethylene to remove that grease. We also use it when we receive our incoming metals because we're unsure of the solvents or coolants or any type of potential liquid that could be on the metal coming from our vendor. We want to make sure that it's fully removed because we need a very clean process in order to get a successful and good plating application layer to it. So we will use it to remove any contaminants from our outside vendors. Lastly, we use teak track lethylene as a final assembly cleaning to remove any residual grease, any residual contaminants from fingers or solvents in our manufacturing process that could have been picked up during the assembly process. Looking at why we want to get rid of TC in our facility, one of the biggest reasons is we want to make our workplace a health and healthier and safer environment for our employees. TC has both acute and long-term side effects that are negative and can have potential negative side effects if there is an exposure. So by fully eliminating TC from our facility, we're able to fully eliminate that potential exposure to our employees making it safer for them to come in every day and go home safely to their family. We also want to reduce our potential environmental impact. TCE, similar to having negative effects on humans, can have negative effects on wildlife by seeping into groundwater supplies or penetrating the groundwater. This could happen by transportation, potential spill when you're pouring it into the vapor degree so that we're using it in, you could spill and have it leak through the ground. So we wanna reduce that envi potential environmental impact. By eliminating TCE fully from our facility, we're able to reduce and completely eliminate that potential exposure that we would have. We also would like to reduce our hazardous chemical usage. This comes into our reporting fees and reports that our EHS manager will have to compile and send out to the Massachusetts EPA and any federal regulatory, uh, regulatory restrictions. In my years and previously, TCE has been become a tighter restricted chemical uh, as more research is being done and completed on the negative effects of it. So as that comes, we keep getting the exposure limit keeps becoming reduced and reduced, which makes it harder for us to purchase quantities as well as increases the fees that we have to pay when we use a certain amount. So by fully eliminating it, we now can eliminate any potential risk that we have in the future and we don't have to worry about those fees. We also would like to fully eliminate ourselves from the Tura program. As Joy talked earlier about, Tura requires us to report to them based on our hazardous chemical usage. We were able to eliminate all chemicals that were on Tura's reporting program except for TCE. So by us eliminating that, we could fully eliminate ourselves from the Tura program and become a better, healthier, safer environment for our employees. Morgan has a history of working with Tura in the OTA, separate from the project that I'm discussing now on TCE. So we have some history that has enabled us to become a successful and fully get rid of the Tura program. As I mentioned, we use TC as a vapor degreaser for our hermeticity. We've done some work with OTA previously, years ago, to come up with a better solvent for TCE. As, and one of those solvents was NPB. So recently we've done work with OTA to help get rid of NPB from our facility as well. So we no longer have NPB or TCE in our facility. Through our contacts at OTA, they were able to refer us to Tura in their lab 
and have and partner us with them to do some outside testing for us. As I'll talk about a little bit later, one of the ways and solutions to eliminating TCE was a water soluble wax that we're able to remove effectively with a borax and baking soda solution. Toro Labs has informed us of some potential, potential negative effects on the environment of the borax and baking soda solution. So that we've worked with the Tura lab to research potential alternatives for detergent testing that can work on removing our wax. Unfortunately, there's a lot of, since we're in the medical implant business, there's a lot of FDA regulations and a lot of customer controlled requirements. So we didn't end up using their recommendations, but having that resource available to us was a huge benefit. We were able to send them parts and they were able to take care of all the testing and at their labs and compile a report for us that we could use to make the best decision for our company. And lastly, Tura was able to help us purchase our equipment to fully eliminate TCE. They provided a grant to us of $30,000, which really helped us to get the funding and help get the numbers on ROI and payback down to uh, acceptable limits that most companies stand by. So through Tura and OTA, they've really helped Morgan get out of the Tura program and it's been a mutually beneficial relationship. Talking about TCE and our wax removal, which was the last area we needed to eliminate it from our facility, we really started breaking it down into our waxes. We use two different waxes, a brown wax and a pink casting wax that were used for different, different areas. The pink casting wax through some testing, we were able to remove with a similar borax and baking soda solution, but the big brown wax that we use for our larger ceramics, we were unable to remove it effectively. That's what we had to use TCE for. Working with one of our sister companies out in California, they helped to develop a water soluble wax. This water soluble wax, we were able to test internally and determine that we can use that on our large, big, bulky parts. And now we can just use a water soluble wax and a brown wax that are, or a water soluble wax, excuse me, and a pink casting wax that are both able to be removed with the same borax and baking soda water solution. Unfortunately, the equipment that we previously had and used was unable to handle the current volumes of the wax. There were some issues during the cleaning process that we needed to resolve in order to fully eliminate the TCE based off our production volumes and our throughputs. This is a picture of our two waxes that we used. On the right is our pink wax. In the left, we have our water soluble wax. This kind of shows you an idea of how we're using the wax in our manufacturing process. It's holding our ceramics in place during the grinding. So when they come in touch with the grinding wheel, they're not getting thrown and, and removed and they're able to be effectively cleaned. As I mentioned, we did have a Crest ultrasonic unit in house that we were able to use to remove the water soluble wax. Unfortunately, it couldn't keep up with our volumes. We implemented that wax on our medical implant product line and that was all it could handle. When we started implementing it into production, we noticed a few problems. One of them was that our water tanks were contaminated and we were able to see floating residuals of wax in our tanks. When we pulled the parts out, that residual wax would create a, a film layer on the top of the ceramics, which wasn't leaving us the fully clean surface that we needed in order to braze to. Part of this problem was that our tanks were still water tanks. There was no cascade. There was no overflow. It was just our water tank. We needed to drain that tank after one full cycle of cleaning six small plates and fill it up with new water to a 170 degrees in order to melt and remove our wax. This process took way too long to keep up with our, with our production needs and it wasn't sustainable in order to meet our customer demands and hold our lead time and delivery debates that we promised our customers. So in order for us to get rid of TCE, we really needed to focus on how can we get a more effective cleaning process. 
This kind of shows you our two waxes and how they looked in the water. The top we have our water soluble Hayward wax. As you can see, it discolors the water. And there's a few little floaters that would leave and settle on the top of the still water that when we pull our ceramics from it leaves a residual. The pink casting wax was even worse than our water soluble wax. That bottom right picture really shows the wax floating at the top. And when you pull your parts out, it just sticks to them. So you're not fully removing it. And that's where we had to try to figure out how can we skim these top floaters off or how can we create a, a cleaner solution for us to use? So we really started looking at a few main areas and ideas. A few of them were for, for filtration and recirculation. Can we recirculate some water using a pump and some filters in combination that we can catch those big particulates that leave the residual on top? Could we use a cascade or an overflow and since those big particulates in that skim layer floats to the top, can we just put some fresh water in at the bottom and have it overflow into a cascade and then we have a clean layer on top? Would that work for us? We started researching the idea of a wax separation unit when we started talking to vendors. Did they have some sort of separate unit away from a wash tank that we would be able to collect our residual wax where it would float and then we would be able to collect all of that and recirculate new water in together. And one of the last things that we really wanted to look for in our potential solution was the capability of testing this new equipment in person. We heard a lot in our discussions with vendors that we think it will be able to do it, but we're unsure. So the big thing for us was if we're going to be spending a large sum of money, we would be able to make sure that it works. In the end, we ended up going with a Crest Ultrasonics DMS modular cleaning system. This system, when we purchased it a year and a half, two years ago, was brand new and they had just rolled it out. And it's a really nice system. The far left, you can see there's four individual stations. We had two wash stations, a rinse station, and a dryer. Each one is its own separate station. Previously, we bought a big unit that was eight feet long and it had three tanks in it, but it was all together. With this new DMS modular system, we're able to have each unit separate. So if we brought this in house and figured we needed another rinse station, we're able to separately purchase a rinse station, disconnect the units that are just bolted on the side and slide it in making it a much more efficient process for us. We were also able to customize the system. We added two wax separation units and two recirculation pumps with filters to each wash station. This has really helped us in collecting our residual wax and our overflows to make sure that we're not pulling our parts out and leaving a residual wax layer on the top layer of them. Here's our wax separation units and you can see the wax and how they're separate. They hold some extra water for us that we're recirculating through. And these, these plastic cylinders help to catch and grab the floaters of wax and let them build together. We have the wax that floats to the top and then there's a barrier on the right side of the tank where we have the fresh water that fills from the bottom up and overflows so that there's no floaters that can get through and back to our recirculation. After the separation units, we also have 10 micron filters on the recirculation pumps. So any of that large floater potential, we're able to capture and prevent it from getting pumped back into our tanks that we're using. This is just a quick video of our cleaning process and our manufacturing process. So here we have our parts pulling them off of our Blanchard grinder after the height grind. In order to clean them, we'll place the parts on a hot plate, let that solid wax start to melt a little bit, become a little bit liquid so we're not putting it all into our tanks. We take our parts and we'll scoop them into one of our baskets. You can see the contaminated on the ceramic, that discoloration of not white. We take our borax baking soda solution and we add that into our two wash tanks, turn on our ultrasonics and let it dissolve and circulate 
for around 10 to 15 minutes before we take our parts and sum submerge them into the tank. What's really nice too about these systems is we're able to program each individual system with a recipe. So the operators just need to go up to the tank screen, each controller has its own screen, load a recipe and press start and then it's all automatic. So that turns on ultrasonics for this right number of time. It sets the pumps for how long they need to go, when they need to turn on, and each system has its own recipe. So it's very nice and very helpful for our operators that they're able to just load the recipe, press start, walk away, and the rest is taken care of for them. It makes it very easy for them. We have our last wash station or rinse station, which we're just using a hot, regular still water with ultrasonics to make sure that any of that residual borax, baking soda, water solution is completely removed before we submerge our parts in a hot air uh, recirculation dryer. This is just using hot forced air, moving around the parts to dry them. It's really critical that we dry our ceramics properly to make sure that we don't have any problems in the manufacturing process at the end. In the end of our process, we have our bare white ceramics ready to be metalized, plated, and built into our final assemblies. Looking at the cost savings for our project, we were using about five drums of TCE previously on a yearly, on a yearly basis just for removing the wax. We were only at five drums because we did have a recycling unit that we would use to recycle our TCE. We would have a vapor degreaser that we had filled with the TCE and every shift our maintenance department would drain that vapor degreaser because it came so saturated with wax that they would drain it out, pump some new TCE in. That old TCE they would take to a distillation unit that we had set up where it would evaporate the TCE, let it solidify in a new drum and separate the wax and any of the other contaminants. This helped keep our TCE usage down and not above some of the, the higher limits such as the EPA compared to Tura. That's where we had a lot of labor costs previously because we were recycling this every day we'd have an operator spending one to two hours cleaning out this tank. With the purchase of TCE, we also had disposal costs. TCE was considered a hazardous waste that we needed to ship out and we didn't have those certifications. So we need to hire an outside company to come truck and store this hazardous waste for us. With the borax mixture, we don't have any hazardous waste. So we're able to eliminate that big disposal cost. We also don't have to purchase a hazardous chemical and ship that in. The borax and baking soda is stuff that you can buy and purchase for your home, so it helps keep our material costs down. One of the other big cost savings was we got out of the Tura program. Getting out of the Tura program helped to free up some of our internal resources. Instead of spending time working on these reports and planning and spending these fees to Tura, we're able now to look at other areas where we can improve the health and safety of our workforce for our employees. Currently with our system, we have a very big labor savings. This ties down to needing to drain our tanks once every day, every day of the year. So now we're doing it once every two weeks. This helps free up our operators and our maintenance team to work on other issues and work on getting more products out the door to our customers in a timely fashion. Overall, we have roughly $32,000 in, in total savings per year. Looking at the Crest equipment, the Crest equipment with all the custom modifications that we made came into right around $95,000. These numbers came out to 21% ROI with roughly a 2.93 year payback, payback funding. This is where the Tura grant that we applied for and were approved for really came in handy. Tura was able to help us with a grant of $30,000 for the equipment purchase. This helped get those ROI and payback numbers down to a two year target that Morgan uses when it evaluates its CapEx proposals. 
So this is, Tura was very key in helping us to get out of their program as well as getting us out of TCE. Looking back, this was a long project. Talking with Darren Rio, our EHNS manager, this is something that he's wanted to do and he's worked on for years. And now we're finally there. So it's a really good achievement for him and his EHNS team. Some of the lessons that we learned, looking at planning and making sure that we're ready to go when our equipment arrived in house, making sure that we're able to have the outside vendors that we need to come in and do our utility piping when we got the equipment in, making sure that we didn't get the equipment in and it wasn't a shell shock to us and we had to scramble and get a, get a plan down at that moment, making sure we had a plan ahead so we could cut down even quicker and make sure we had this implemented as soon as possible so we could get rid of this TC from our facility. That was a big, big important step that I learned myself when planning and working on this project. One of the other big takeaways was utilizing our available resources. As I mentioned, TUR's grant really helped us to get this project approved and really helped to convince upper management that now's the time to take this project and complete it. Now's the time to do it. We have this available money to us in the grant form. If we don't do it now, it might not be there. Utilizing our available resources was very key. TUR helped us with the grant they helped us with the outside testing on our detergents that we didn't end up implementing due to other constraints with our customers. But using that available resource was very key to us and it's been very beneficial. Similarly, collaboration. Morgan partnered, New Bedford partnered with Morgan out in California to create a mutually beneficial relationship. Without our sister company in California, helping us with the water soluble wax, we might not have been able to fully eliminate TCE. Using that collaboration as a big global company was another big takeaway. Just because we might not have a solution in New Bedford doesn't mean that somebody else in our company doesn't have a solution that we can use. So using those resources, building those connections was very key. One of the last lessons was making sure that we're testing our equipment sufficiently. When we had this brought in house, we had a few problems after the installation technician left that we think could, could have been resolved quicker and with less of our internal resources if we had spent more time with that installation technician going over the functionality, making sure that everything could run for more than five minutes. And that was a big takeaway for myself personally, making sure that we're testing everything and it's working fully before we give the okay. Uh, so that's, that's what I have. Uh, and I think we're going to open it now to questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. That was really great. And I, I particularly appreciate seeing the video and seeing it in action. I got a much better sense of what you're dealing with there. Um, so we did have a question about the cost of the equipment, which you covered. So, and, and, and what you said was that um, you were able to add up all of the various costs associated with the use of this, um, uh, with the whole process of the cost savings, and then add on the grant from Turi, and that was able to bring you down to a two year payback. Great. So that's great. I'm really glad to hear that. We have a question here. Um, so, oh, that's a question about the slides. And yes, absolutely, the slides will be available. We'll be posting the recording and the slides on our website afterwards. Um, let's see, do you have a wastewater permit for discharge from your cleaning operations? I'm gonna pass that on to Darren, because <laughs> each and S guy can help us out with that. You're the process engineer. We do, we do have a wastewater permit. Uh huh. And do you, what are the um, the the fatty oils and grease um, limits for your discharge? Oh, you're putting me on the spot. Uh, not me, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to look that up in a permit. I uh, that's not something I recall at, off the top of my head. Okay. Um, so those are the only questions that I have on the chat. But I want to just kind of open it up. If anybody has a question they'd like to pose to either Matt or Darren now, please please just feel free to unmute yourself 
and um, go ahead and ask. I have a question, Robin Teedy from Hubbard Hall. Hey, uh, what is the name of your sister company in California? Is it Morgan Engineering? I believe it's Morgan Advanced Materials, but they also go by Wesgo. Wesgo. Wesgo okay. or Morgan Engineered Ceramics, potentially. Okay, thank you. Yep. Sandra, did you want to have a, did you want your follow-up question? Do you want me to ask that or you can go ahead and do it yourself? I will go ahead and ask. Sandra is wondering um, if the equipment was custom designed. So it, it wasn't custom designed, but we did have some custom modifications to it. Um, so Crest came to us with their base unit of what they offer with a few different select add-ons that they had already had. Uh, so a few add-ons were the wax separation oil coalescers, the recirculation pumps and filtrations. Those were all additional options that we could have added on or, or taken without. So it was customizable in the sense that you can purchase an equipment piece of equipment from Crest without those options, but you could out also add them on specifically if your operation uh, required them. Great. Yeah. And so that, that also gives you flexibility for the future, as you had said. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I muted Sandra. My, my apologies. So, um, Shannon notes that it's just great to hear about a success story like that, especially when it's not smooth. And you had mentioned that one of the lessons that you took away personally, Matt, was just that spending more time with the installation technician would have been really helpful. Can you elaborate a little bit? Did you, you, you said something about only running for five minutes. Was that what was happening? So we, when we had it installed, uh, I spent some time going over the functionality and and doing, making sure that the equipment would turn on. And when I told a pump to turn on, it would turn on. Um, we were looking more for, I guess, from my perspective, it was late in the day. He was trying to get out of there for a day. It had been a, a long day already. So it wasn't as in depth where we didn't necessarily let our pump run for two hours like we would in our daily operation. It was, okay, I turn my pump on, it runs for five minutes continually without problems, but that didn't necessarily mean that it would run for four or six hours like we, like we require in our daily operation. Um, so that's what I'm talking about specifically with that. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of when I recently had my washer and dryer delivered. <laughs> so yeah, yes. and, you know, really kind of forcing people to slow down and say, hey, you know, we're paying yep. you for this and we need to make sure that we've got everything square. Right. And kind of putting subject with the installation technician there, kind of subjecting it to what our daily process will be. Not just a, a quick run through my cycle, run through my checklist, everything turns on and it works but okay, let me run through a cycle with you here, make sure that everything functions the way it's supposed to be when I'm actually doing my process. Because obviously in a testing environment in the real world, sometimes you get some slight differences with your, with your results. Absolutely, yeah, really, really good takeaway. Um, so we have a question here from Fernando. You mentioned that you mix the borax and baking soda and then put it into the tank and let it mix up in the tank for about 10 minutes. And the question is, why did it, why do you let it go for that long? So we just, uh, we scoop our borax in and then we will scoop our baking soda in and we turn on the ultrasonics for around 10 minutes. That's kind of to degas our water and we'll turn our ultrasonics on just to make sure that all of that chemical and powder is fully dissolved uh, because we didn't want any grains left on our ceramics or potential, making sure it's fully dissolved and making sure that it's uh, effective in our cleaning process. Mm -hmm. Great. So here's a question about the labor, sav labor savings that you calculated. So was that all related to production and cleaning reductions? Um, or did it also include labor associated with the sort of planning and reporting? The labor savings that we had calculated were strictly related to the cleaning and 
cleaning out of the old equipment compared to the new equipment and the recycling of the TCE. Right, so in fact, there might have been a little bit more. So I, I'm going to write that down, and I think my boss will be very happy to hear that there might be more labor savings we can get. <laughs> yeah, you might want to talk to Darren. I'm sure he could give you a sense of what that was. Oh, yeah, Darren will be the guy to go to for that. Yeah. Um, so roughly how much wax removed um, do you remove per month? Or do you have like a rate of wax removal, like a capacity that you know? I'm unsure of that. It all depends on what products we're running that month. Um, Cause our, our ceramics team is also working to reduce how much wax we're using. So instead of waxing everything to a plate, they've started to create some grinding plates um, that will be able to hold the parts in place without needing the wax. Excuse me. So uh, to that answer, I can't tell. And it's very hard because not all of the wax that we use on our grinding plate then gets put into our crest, crest line. Um, from the video, we're, we're melting the wax and then scooping the parts on. So some of that wax ends up in a containment area off, off to the side and we're not putting, in, putting it into our system. Right. And that helps keep our system cleaner and reduces how much we have to clean and drain our tanks before they become saturated with wax. Right. So when you when you talk about reducing or eliminating your use of TCE, you know, finding a process, finding finding a, a different material that allows you to go water based was one step of it. Looking at alternative solvents was another step of that. Moving towards a water based and finding the right detergent to right. let it happen. Finding the equipment that allowed it all to function was really great, but also looking upstream, like you said, and looking for opportunities to not be using the wax was helpful. So a lot of different toxics use reduction techniques went into your final solution, which is really great. Correct. This was really a multifaceted project. There were multiple steps in this. It wasn't just one step in it. It wasn't one year that we took to complete this project. This was a multifaceted, multi-year project um, that, that took place in different phases, but now we're, we're in that cumulative phase where we're able to look back and see all the progress that we've made. Mm -hmm. Great. So I have an interesting question here. Um, so has Morgan been a good neighbor with respect to keeping residents around you informed or availing themselves um, to, uh, you know, uh, being open to getting questions from your residents? The, the, the neighborhoods around where you are. How's that worked out? And maybe Darren, that's a question for you. Well, I, I have to say, I think um, maybe not for this specific project, but we have worked with our neighbors um, quite a bit on safety because safety is a, a big portion of our environmental health and safety program here. And we've we've provided quite a bit of advice to our surrounding. We're in an industrial park. We've had at least one, two, three of our neighbors stop in uh, looking at what we do for safety and we provided a lot of guidance to them. Okay, and that's a good point that you're not, you're not like tucked away in a, some residential area, you're actually in an industrial park. So you've got a little bit less of an impact on general public in the immediate vicinity. But working with your peers in the industrial park, that's, that's really a wonderful thing to be doing. So um, are there other questions that anybody would like to pose? Um, I think I have everybody muted and I, you can raise your hand if you would like to be unmuted. You can do that by um, clicking on, you know, hovering over your face and uh, there's three dots. You can click on that to find the raise your hand icon or you can put it into the chat. Uh, let's see. We'll, we'll let you know about getting your certificate um, for continuing education. We'll reach out to everybody who wants a certificate um, after this. Any other questions for Matt or Darren or for Joy about the Turi Grant program itself? I think we're good then. Joy, do you have any follow, any, any last words? 
I don't. Just to say thank you to everybody for joining us this afternoon or morning, wherever you may be. And um, thanks so much to Matt for providing such a fantastic presentation. I think that um, you were um, so comprehensive um, and understandable that um, there weren't a whole lot of needed clarifying questions. So that's excellent. Um, so thanks so much to everybody for joining and we'll be posting, like Pam said, the recording and the slides. Um, and we also have a case study that we just finished, uh, which provides a lot of the um, similar information, but it also does provide the um, test results of the testing that the Turi lab did of the alternative. So if you're interested in seeing uh, what other detergents were tested to potentially do the job that the borax baking soda mixture are doing from work and you can see those test results and, uh, and an EHNS evaluation of those different alternatives in the case study that we're posting online. Great. Thank you so much. And yes, Matt, great job today. And thank you, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you.